to Sisters of Crime Orange County. We have a great panel today. We have two very talented uh, uh, authors whose ideas and uh, books really illustrate how important characters and settings are to stories, particularly mysteries. Uh, so we're going to welcome Lee Goldberg. Lee is a two-time Edgar Award and two-time Seamus Award nominee and the number one New York Times bestselling author of more than 30 novels. Mm -hmm. He has also written and or produced uh, scores of TV shows. I always wonder how much score, how many scores are, but maybe we could talk about that later. Okay. Um, Co-created a Hallmark movie series, which we talked about before you got here, um, and is an inter- Do you like the show or do you, does it suck? Just let me yeah. know now. <laughs> okay. Uh, and is an international television consultant. Lee, a longtime Angelino, set the Eve Ronin series in his own neighborhood of Calabasas, California, where the Lost Hills Sheriff Station is located. The series features an ambitious young detective who is in over her head, but is determined to prove her self-worth and get the job done, no matter what the personal cost. Uh, joining us also is Quay Cordy. Quay is a crime fiction writer and physician based in Pasadena, California. Quay was born in Ghana, West Africa, and wanted to be an author from an early, uh, early age. In his teenage years, his interest shifted to being a doctor. Well, that's a natural progression we saw there, Quay. <laughs> and he finished medical school after moving to the US. Quay practiced medicine for more than 15 years while simultaneously working as a writer. He retired from medical practice in 2018 to become a full-time novelist. As a crime fiction writer, Quay has written five Inspector Darko Dawson novels set in Ghana before starting his Emma, is it John? John. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Investigation series, which fe features the first West, West African female private eye in fiction. Sleep Well, My Lady, the second novel in the series, immediately garnered attention for its unusual style of time shifts in relation to the murder. So welcome, everybody. Thank you. Um, Barbara, do you want to start the questioning or you want me to? Well, I think first you should compliment both authors who have not spoken to each other yet, but did get the memo on having the colorful polo shirt. Notice oh. the strip of color on Quay's and the strip of color on mine. Very nice, very nice. Excellent. Very Excellent. coordinated. <laughs> well, I wonder if we could begin with, uh, maybe each of them could talk about, each of you could talk about your books and how your books came about. You want to go and first? And I think you're also talking about characters and setting as well. So anything that relates to that would be yeah. really wonderful. Well, as you heard, I was uh, born in Ghana. My my mom was my late mom. Both my parents are dead now. Um, my late mom was uh, a Black American, and my father was Ghanaian. And we lived on the campus of the University of Ghana, which was a uh, uh, I would say a quite a delighted, uh, delightful place. I, I don't have any tortured stories of angst and... Oh, then I'm leaving. <laughs> <laughs> I came for tortured angst. <laughs> Bait and switch, I'm out of here. <laughs> yeah, so, but I, but my impetus for writing started very early. I When I was a kid, I used to uh, write by hand or or type and uh, staple all my pages together and do a design on the cover and which is what they now call um, self-publishing. Um, <laughs> and um, so when my, after a lot of troubles, political troubles in Ghana, my mom wanted to come back to the States. And so I joined her and I'd already started medical school in Ghana. And so I managed to get into Howard University in Washington, D.C., and that, that's where I finished my, um, my medical degree. Um, so what happened was I started to write a story set in a Ghana-like country um, because I hadn't been back in so long, and I didn't really know what was going on. So, but somebody I sent a manuscript to said, you know, why are you writing a Ghana-like country when you lived in Ghana yourself? So, and that's when I realized, okay, I've got to go back and start doing my research. So I, I have been since about 2009 visiting Ghana about once a year. Uh, the COVID year is an exception, of course. 
Um, and I do my research on my books. And my first character was Darko Dawson, Inspector. That's a police procedural. And my latest uh, series is Emma Jan, who um, is a private eye. And um, she's just finding her feet in the second novel. She was a little bit tentative in the first, but that's a, that's a quick summary. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. In a way, I'm his career backwards. I've never been a doctor, but I wrote about doctors a lot. I was the executive producer and principal writer of a show called Diagnosis Murder. Yeah. I remember my mother saying, you should have become a doctor and then a writer, not the other <laughs> way around. You'd make more money. Yeah. I'd be more proud of you. Um, the short version of my life story, which I won't give you the whole uh, details of, is my mother was a gossip columnist. She went to parties for a living and <laughs> wrote about them. And my father was a television anchorman up on KPIX in San Francisco. And he talked like this his entire life. With the same insincere smile I've got on my face right now. <laughs> so television and writing were always part of my life. And, and like Quay, I was writing my own stories from a very young age. My first novel was called the Tomorrow's Warrior, The Magic Man, about a guy who was born in the future in an underwater sperm bank. Why it was underwater, how you made deposits, I don't know, but I thought it sounded very futuristic. And he went into the, into the past to save lives. And I wrote versions of the saint and you know, I basically copied lots of stuff. But my first novel was published when I was 19 years old. It was wow. called 357 Vigilante by Ian Ludlow. So I'd be on the shelf next to Robert Ludlow and Ian for Ian Fleming. So people would go, oh. <laughs> Ian Ludlow, you know, I think I read something by him. It wasn't bad. <laughs> My book came out the same week. This guy Bernard Getz blew away some muggers on a New York subway train. Vigilantes were hot. New World Pictures bought the movie rights to my book, hired me to write the script. Movie didn't get made, but my television and writing career were born when I was essentially 19 years old. And I've had a, a long career in television doing lots of terrible shows and a couple of good ones. But I've kept writing books all the way along. I wrote diagnosis murder novels based on my TV series. I, I wrote monk novels. I wrote standalone novels. My current, and, and, and like Quay, I, I, I travel to wherever I'm, I'm writing about. So I'm, I'm a big believer in boots on the ground, that you pick up details in places that you can't get from watching Rick Steves or Anthony Bourdain or right. looking at Google Earth. Yeah. So I wrote a bunch of international thrillers with Janet Ivanovich, and I would go to the places I wrote about. I would go to Hong Kong. I would go to Paris. I, I would go everywhere, um, except Turkey. I didn't go to Turkey. But there are a few places I did not go. But for the most part, I went to, to the place I wrote about. Yeah. As it turned out, I got very lucky. The book I wrote that came out just when the pandemic started, Lost Hills, was right outside my front door. And I, I chose Lost Hills, and we're talking about why place is important to our writing. Place is so important in these books that it's the titles of my books. My books aren't called Eve Ronin or Cop Girl or whatever. They're called The Place They Take Place In. Well, I, I figured, I want to write a police procedural in Los Angeles, but my God has been done to death. I mean, who's going to do it better than Michael Connolly or Joseph Wambaugh or Raymond Chandler? And, and, and forget the authors for a minute. There have been 10,000 TV shows set in Los Angeles. What am I going to bring different to it? And, and that sort of forced me to come up with a, a corner of Southern California no one has looked at before. And that's the Lost Hills jurisdiction of Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. It is an island within Los Angeles, bound on all sides by oceans of other jurisdictions. It exists, it's like a, a domed world. It, it, it has all the socioeconomic strata of Los Angeles, even the movie industry. There's a, there's a movie studio essentially in the center of Lost Hills in and of itself, which gave me a unique way of exploring Los Angeles and the world I live in. And we can get more into that later, but it gave me a unique um, setting that was in a place that's not unique, that's been written about and explored a thousand different ways. But as I'm sure Quay will get into as well, no matter where you are, the, the prism that you're viewing the, the place through is your character. And your character is always going to be original, and that'll make any place fresh, though it's a challenge in a place as well written about and as cliche written as Los Angeles. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting. I didn't know about Lost Hills. Uh, <laughs> I just learned something. Well, Lost Hills is, 
is bounded by Ventura County to the north and Los Angeles on, on uh, uh, two other sides, and then the Pacific Ocean on another side. And it's an unincorporated area that includes Malibu Creek State Park, Malibu, Calabasas, Agura, all these different communities. It, it encompasses rural, it encompasses very wealthy, it encompasses the beach, it encompasses state parks, it encompasses hippy dippy places that seem trapped in 1966. It's a, a world unto itself, yet there are all these jurisdictional disputes because of the LAPD, the Ventura County Sheriff's Department, and, and what have you. It's a, it's a fascinating area. Hopefully I can write thousands of books set here. <clears throat> um, do you fellas ever um, create fictional settings? Or are you always writing about some place you knew, you've been to, or you know, you have personal experience with? Yeah, I, I make it a point um, every single location in my novel, with the exception of maybe my first Darko Dawson novel, which was called Wife of the Gods, where I did, um, I had a fictional village. Um, but every other, every other book has the real locations in it. And some of the experiences are also um, what I've experienced. Uh, for example, when I, uh, my, my novel um, Murder at Cave Three Points, uh, the character had to go on um, a helicopter flight from the mainland to an off offshore oil rig, which was about 40 miles offshore. And when you do that, you have to undergo training. The, uh, they, they call it um, helicopter um, underwater egress training, or Hewitt, um, <laughs> <laughs> where they basically put you in a pool and they turn you upside down in this uh, compartment and you have to get out. Uh, I'll never do it again. But anyway, <laughs> I, I, um, I managed to pass after three attempts. And then um, I was able to go on a real oil rig and it was really something. So yeah, everything that I have in my books has, uh, I have actually experienced or observed. And I try to make that a point because I know people watching, you know, this is a very different land from, you know, most of our rest Western read, uh, readers. So they really need to get a lot of details about what's going on. And so I don't like to make that kind of stuff up. Uh, you know, if, if somebody asked me, did you really do that? You know, I want to be able to say, yes, I did do that. Yeah. So I don't know about you, Lee. Oh, I've committed every murder, sex act, and, and driving <laughs> violation in my books. I'm a, and also it's been diagnosed as murder. I did every surgery. I don't have a medical degree, but damn it, I wanted the realism. I didn't want people to think I was faking it. Right. And no, I have not done everything that my characters have done. Or I do try to go to all the they places, but I, I try not to rape and murder and do operations without a medical license or prescribe yeah. you know, uh, drugs. Um, my feeling is I'm not writing a documentary. I'm telling a story. I'm telling a lie. I'm just out there to entertain you. All I need is that foundation of truth so you'll believe all the other BS I spew at you. To yeah. create that... That, that, that foundation that allows you to suspend your disbelief and go along with me for my tale. The original question was, have we ever made up a place for the purposes of our fiction? And I did that, yes, in one book called King City. Notice also named after the fictional place because I wanted to write about a specific kind of place and I couldn't decide whether it was gonna be Spokane, Washington or Portland, Oregon. So I just combined the two and created my own fictional city on, on the Columbia River and. And it made things a lot easier. I could create my own neighborhoods. But yeah. by and large, I think it's a waste of time. Everyone knows, I think it's, I'm mispronouncing it, Isola in the Ed McBain 87th Precinct novels is New York. Everyone knows Santa Teresa in uh, Sue Grafton's books is Santa Barbara. Instead, I use real places and I take geographic liberties. In the yeah. same way that 24 made it possible for you to go anywhere in Los Angeles County in five minutes. Yeah. I, I take some, some liberties with geography and time and traffic. And, and I prefer to write about a real place um, if I can. I think it's less work. It's a lot more work to make up a fictional world, an entirely fictional world, than to put fiction in a real world. Yeah. In a way, it sort of demands it in Los Angeles because here's what's unique about Los Angeles. It's a real place, but it's also just an idea. I mean, Los Angeles has sound stages where movies are shot. But the fact is every street in Los Angeles is a stage. You can drive all over LA and everywhere has been somewhere else in the movies. 
So in a way, we have police officers solving crimes in a place where fake crimes and police fake police officers are roaming every day. And, I, and the real police are running up against the fictional police, or at least our expectations of what police should be based on fiction all the time. So in, in a way, I don't think there's anything wrong with making crap up about Los Angeles because Los Angeles is a fiction. Yeah. If you're following my strange twisted thought there, <laughs> but it, it's, it's, it's interesting to write fiction in a town that is so essentially fictional. Well, if you get something wrong or you know, if you've altered it a bit, do you hear from readers? And yes, I, goes and for I write like back. Procedural stuff too, you know, anything in the police procedure, the, the, the investigation of something, you know, you get something a little wrong. What do you hear? I say it's called fiction. <laughs> yeah. Did you enjoy it? Were you, were you entertained? That doesn't matter whether it's real or not. But at the same time, I have cops you know, leaving comments on, on Amazon saying, oh, he gets it so right. And I have people who aren't cops saying, he gets it so wrong. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah, a, a, a lot of times my my response is, you know, it's not that serious, guys. <laughs> this is fiction. <laughs> but um, I think I had the most trouble in my, my first novel, um, Wife of the Gods. And that was, be that was, the, that was the book that, I based on my first visit back after, you know, some 15 years. And so there was some, you know, technically incorrect things in the novel. And I had this one guy who, um, he's a Ghanaian, but he lives in um, the States and he belongs to the ethnic group that I was writing about. And he just tore me <laughs> up and down saying how, I made the foods wrong. This person from the South wouldn't eat this. And it was, it was pretty bad. And then um, I had a very interesting um, exchange with my German publishers. When they published Wife of the Gods in German, in German, they emailed me and they said, they asked me why I hadn't, why my um, character had gone to a hospital a certain hospital, which was the, the real name of the hospital, when he could have gone to one that was um, two miles closer or something like that. And so I emailed them back and said, yeah, but that hospital is closed on Tuesday. <laughs> so you remind me of something I haven't thought about in 40 <laughs> years. I'm betraying my age now. But I, when I wrote uh, 357 Vigilante, as I mentioned, I was 19 years old, writing under a pseudonym. And my publisher invited me to um, uh, ALA book, fell, uh, book Fair, which at that time was being held in San Francisco. And with all his other authors, all, all the published other authors who are writing things like The Executioner, The Destroyer, The Immolator, you know, all, all these really tough action venture, male action venture uh, books. And I went, this pimply faced 19 year old, and there was a guy who looked like he crawled out of the jungles of <laughs> Vietnam on his hands and knees. I mean, he looked like a lot of hard road. And he came up to me and said, your book is bullshit. I could tell the moment I read it, you'd never kill the man. <laughs> the way you described his brain sitting in the wall was all wrong. If you'd ever put your gun in the mouth of another individual and pulled the trigger, you'd know that. I was like, well, you got me. You got me. I, I didn't do the research. I failed to stick a gun in some guy's mouth. <laughs> just, some people just take it way, way too seriously. By the way, if I move my head, you can see the original painting for the Vigilante novel behind me. The top part all stayed the same and they repainted the bottom part to capture the action in each subsequent novel. This is back before the days of computer uh, 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 graphics and stuff. I don't know how well you can see it on the camera, but that's the original painted cover from the Vigilante novels. Nice. So, um, so they say, um, Barb, are you done? Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. So um, people who give, uh, they, the right people who give writing advice, they say that uh, character de or setting details and all those other things have to work in service to the plot. So both of your crimes are tied to the settings uh, and uniquely tied to the settings. We have brush fires and things that feel very LA. Is that correct, Lee? Am I? I would correct you in that I don't think they have to apply it to the plot. I think that to be true to the character. I okay. don't think people pay, people don't remember the plots. They remember the characters. When you think of the Rockford Files or Columbo, you think of the character. 
And to me, everything is viewed through the prism of character. I don't just give you a ton of details about the locations. I give you the details as they matter to the lead character and how he or she is experiencing that world. Otherwise, it's just exposition and it's boring. Yes, it has to reveal character. Yes, it has to push the plot forward. But there's a tendency, especially among people who go and research uh, locations, to show off that they've researched them, to put in all these details so you know they actually went there. All you need is one salient detail, one thing that brings the place alive, and then let the story dictate what you reveal about the setting. Craig, what do you think? I mean, as far as um, choosing where you're going to set the uh, yeah story, yeah. I, I agree. With its you. relationship to the I agree with me in, in that um, it, I think it has to be. It has to sort of mesh with the story as a, as a whole. And Lee is right. You know, or it, Uh, on the page, and then it sounds, you know, very didactic. Any little details that are Im important to include in the plot, and um, I may make my, my my settings a little bit more um, of a character than maybe uh, Lee does. But yeah, I'd like to describe how you know there's a certain smell of the place, or um, um, you know, it 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 has a certain um, feel to it. And, um, and I give the, the feeling to the reader why I'm really inside of what's going on, you know, and um, those who have been to Ghana before and they are having some technical difficulty here. Oh, I thought that was just you me. Know, they, <laughs> No, we are. Quay. Quay, we're having a little technical difficulty, Quay. You freeze. I'm sure you're saying really intelligent things that we're missing and great writing advice, but um, we're going to let you unfreeze and we're going to move on. And hopefully the internet gods will, will change things up well, for well, us. Just t taking a point that I that he made that I, that I heard, I thought it was just my thing that was freezing up. No. I, I, I think I write really tight and lean. And when I was co-authoring books with Jan Ivanovich and traveling to all these exotic locations that we were writing about, I would I would write really tight. I'd think, okay, this one paragraph really sells the location. And she would cut it down to the to one line. And I would realize, my God, she was right. That one line said it all. Everything else was just blah blah. And I think that's the real skill. If you look at uh, Robert B. Parker and you look at um, Elmore Leonard and there are a lot of other writers that do this. They're able to find the one key detail of a person's character, either the way they dress or speak or a mannerism or of a place, and let you fill in the blanks, let you color between the lines. And I think it's different with Quay when you're going to a really different place. I, I know when I was trying to describe Macau or, or Hong Kong or something that was maybe a little bit different than what people are used to, maybe I went a little bit too far. <laughs> Two lines instead of one line would have been fine. But it's tough. There's a real desire to to pay off that airplane ticket to Europe by writing a whole bunch of stuff in the book to show you, yes, I went there. Or in my case with the Lost Hills novels, I've done a lot of research talking to police officers, attending forensic and investigative seminars all over the country. And there is a real tendency to want me, for me to want to prove, yes, I have dug up bones. And I know this is how it's done. But I don't do that. What I do instead is I, I try to have one interesting detail and then let that knowledge sort of come through in the dialogue and what my people do. Let it inform the action in ways I'm not even aware of until later when I read the book in Galley. Um, I think that's a better way to do it, that your characters are speaking from an intelligence that you have, and it will come through on the page. You don't need to shine a light on it and hammer the reader with the research you've done. I, I find it, there are authors I won't mention who go way too far, the color of the paper clips and the murder book and wh what kind of three-hole punch paper they're using and, 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 and all this stuff just to show they've had their hands on a murder book. We <laughs> believe you. You don't need to go into that kind of detail. Well, and, and you know, setting is more than just location. You know, and I, um, I was reading some of the uh, reviews for Sleep Well and some of your other books and they were saying the language and the pace and the way you view 
uh, what's going on around the crime and people involved in solving the crime goes to setting just as much as where it's actually located. So when, how did you hear this voice? How did you come up with the voice for the Emma John series? Well, you know, it, it actually started with my last Darko Dawson novel, um, where I introduced a new female character, a new female, um, are you hearing me okay? I hope so. <laughs> a new uh, female character who was the assistant to Darko Dawson. And I was going to have a, um, a sort of like an offshoot or a spinoff uh, using that character, but having Darko sort of being around as a, like a mentor or somebody who could help out. But um, my, my editor at Soho Press said, no, 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 no. If it's going to be a new series, it's got to be a whole totally new series. So I had to redo uh, that. And um, so what happened was I had to create a new character who was not a police person like Darko was. And that's when I got the idea of having um, somebody who started out in the, in the police force and then got kicked out. And because she got kicked out, she stumbled on being a private eye. And, and that's how you know she was, she was born. And um, the funny thing is that I noticed that I tell a lot of people this is that um, to my great surprise, when I was writing Emma, I feel I feel a lot more relaxed <laughs> uh, than I did with Darko. And I, I don't know if it's that male, male, macho competition thing, but um, it, I feel very much more relaxed and less tense uh, when I'm, I'm writing Emma than compared to Darko which is an interesting uh, phenomenon, I think. Well, well, neither one of you uh, made it easy for your protagonists uh, com coming in. Um, Lee, you wanna talk a little bit about Eve and how she got to where she, the rough road that brought well, her to where she is? First, let me start how I came up with Eve. Oh. I had another crime novel in mind and I got invited to a homicide investigators training conference in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Homicide investigators, at least in Wisconsin, have to attend 24 hours of education every year to requalify. So they learn latest techniques, they go over old cases and things. And a friend of mine runs this program, and I was the only civilian invited in. And uh, they presented a case, and they had the detectives and the and the blood splatter experts and the defense, uh, the prosecutors, everybody involved in the case was there presenting it. The case was one where if you went into it with any preconceptions of what is homicide investigator common sense, you wouldn't have solved the crime. But this case defied all the common sense uh, of, a, of an officer. And that it's important to approach each homicide as if you've never investigated a homicide in your life. Well, how's a veteran homicide detective going to do that? Well, as I listened to this case, I became fascinated with it and I realized I could turn it into a novel but how can I come up with an investigator who could put all of that aside? Well, what if I had an investigator who never solved a homicide before? Well, how would an investigator like that even get in the, in the homicide department? You'd have to have years of experience and build up all that common sense. Well, how about if someone got in who didn't deserve to be there? And, and, and it just, the, the character sort of emerged from the demands of the story in a way. And I wanted to write about a woman because I had been, you know, writing male oriented stuff for a while, but also, I had written 15 monk novels from the first person point of view of monk's female assistant. And I missed that voice, that, that attitude. And I was tired of middle-aged burned out cops who are, you know, have a, are haunted by the serial killer in their past and they're divorced and their boss hates them and, yeah. and they're alcoholics or drug addicts or, nympho or sex addicts or whatever. I just, I wanted a clean slate. And, and so Eve Ronan just sort of emerged from, from that. I wanted to buck the cliches and I wanted to, to to write about a young woman and because she gets into the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department she's already in there she's a deputy but the way she gets this job is while she's off duty she sees a Hollywood star beating the crap out of a woman and she arrests him and it's caught on on people's phones all over the place and the video goes viral right. at a time when the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department is in the middle of another one of their many scandals and to change the news cycle, the sheriff's department just focuses on her, they promote her, and, and she essentially gets a job she doesn't deserve. 
and has to prove herself not just to the world to to her other officers and in, in, in the sheriff's department but also to the media and to herself and then she gets a, a homicide case that would be a challenge for even the most seasoned homicide detective mm -hmm. that creates conflict and conflict is what drives any good drama or a comedy if you got lots of conflict you have lots of story and it makes it exciting and what i particularly like is that my heroine has a gift she's good at what she does but she doesn't have the skills yet to apply that talent so she makes lots of mistakes and i think i can do a few novels before she's at a point where she's harry bosch or or some other seasoned detective who has the confidence to to know what she's doing and be invested in it to see her make those mistakes and have to own them and solve them makes it so much more interesting for me as a writer, but I think so much more interesting for the reader to follow along. She's not Adrian Monk. She's not Columbo. She's not Harry Bosch. She's fallible. And, and, and in many ways, because of her mistakes, she sees things that other people wouldn't see by owning her mistakes. And it also gives me a chance to explore the cliches because she's aware of them too and how she doesn't live up to them. So in a way I'm telling a police story but also telling an anti-police story. I'm holding a camera up or a light on all the cliches and tropes of the genre at the same time I'm kind of following them. So it's it makes it challenging for me as a writer and forces me not to fall into those cliches myself. And I, and I think Lee also that gives you um, room to for her to to evolve as well. And that's and, and readers I think really like to see that. Well, the other thing I've done with her that's that's, that's plus I have to keep it challenging for myself. I know from doing television, I mentioned Diagnosis Murder earlier. I did a hundred episodes of that show. And then I did eight novels. You reach a point where there's nothing more to explore. There's no conflicts left. And I think it's important to come up with whether you're, whatever your franchise is, whether it's Private Eye or Cop or Alien Who Solves Crimes, whatever, to come up with as many built-in conflicts that you can so that you're generating stories that, that that make it fresh every time. So no matter what the case is, the case will allow you to explore an aspect of your hero or heroine's character that hasn't been seen before. Because when you get to the point there's you've seen every aspect, it's when you should walk away from the series. Yeah. And there, there are too many characters, I think, who don't evolve. And I think if they don't evolve, you're just doing the same book every time, but a little different. And it becomes formulaic. And I think you can tell when a writer has lost interest in the characters they're writing about. It shows in, in the writing. Yeah. So, so Kwai, you um, also have not uh, created an easy road for Emma uh, and, and a path for her. And there, um, there is a tangential connection to celebrity in, in your story as well. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about the difference maybe between uh, the way she approaches this uh, as opposed to maybe a police detective as a private detective? Yeah, um, <clears throat> the, the reality in Ghana is that um, if, you, if you are a private eye, in general, um, most of your work is done undercover. Um, in other words, you are pretending to be somebody else. So for example, if you, let's say there was a, a theft or a murder in the factory, you know, you, ne you need to, Emma would have to, somehow get in there and be able to investigate um, what happened as a worker there, for example. Um, she can be confrontational because confrontation doesn't <laughs> really work in Ghana, at least not for um, investigation. You know, you can't come up and say like, hey, what were you doing uh, on the night of this murder? I mean, nobody's going to give you any information. So like in um, <clears throat> Sleep Well, My Lady, she needs to find out what exactly happened to some of the evidence um, at the uh, forensics lab, what happened to it. And so she goes and pretends to be, you know, like a, a janitor there. And then at the other end of the scale, she pretended she was a, a wealthy uh, woman who was about to buy, you know, a million dollar um, <laughs> mansion <laughs> and got to ride in the Mercedes uh, for her first time in her life. So, you know, you have, you have to take on these different uh, personas to get the information that, that you have. And, and I, in real life, I actually have to rely on 
um, a couple of private detectives that I know in Ghana to get me some of the information because first of all, I wouldn't be able to get it because they can see me coming from a, a mile away that I'm American. I mean, I may be black to all of you, but I'm not black when I go to Ghana. <laughs> It's like, oh, American coming, alert, alert. <laughs> Jack up all your prices, there's an American coming. <laughs> so, so yeah, I have to depend quite heavily on them because they can blend into, you know, the, the, um, the environment, whereas I would not be able to. You remind me of a story that has nothing to do with, with race, but how we show who we are, whether we know it or not. Um, I mentioned that homicide investigators training conference. I was the only civilian there. Everyone else was a cop. Now you can yeah. tell because they had the badges and the guns in some cases and others, they just had the walk and yep. the thousand yard stare. I come in and I am clearly not a cop. Yeah. And they can tell it's like for breakfast, it was like high school in a new town. I was at my own table. You know, they could tell I didn't belong there. But <laughs> then when the, they start presenting the case, it was in the dark and I figured I had paid to be here. I asked lots of questions of the detectives presenting the case. At the lunch break, I went up and asked him more. And we were talking and he said, you know, I really appreciate your questions. Uh, what law enforcement agency are you with? And I said, I'm a senior investigator with the WGA. And he said, <laughs> I'm not familiar with that agency. I said, Writers Guild of America. And he said, you're a fucking writer? How the <laughs> fuck did you get in here? And I, I pointed to the guy who, who run the program who waved and the detective looked at the guy who ran the program and said, well, if you're good enough for him, you're good enough for me. Keep asking the questions. And <laughs> once the cops saw me with the cool guy, they kind of accepted me. And then that night, the whole conference is held in a, this before the pandemic, but we were still sort of quarantined in a hotel. I started buying drinks for all the cops. And once they found out I was from Hollywood and that I was, an, you can get all the drinks you want from that guy, suddenly they loved me <laughs> and all wanted to tell me their stories. But they knew immediately I wasn't a cop. I mean, I, I could have come wearing a gun and a badge it wouldn't have mattered. I reeked young Jewish white guy from Calabasas. Yeah, I think uh, Kara Black also, you know, her, her um, character um, is, operates in Paris. Uh, Luke, I forgot the last name. Aimé, Luke Aimé. And she says she, um, the way she gets a lot of information from the cops there, or Le Flic as they call them, there is, um, you know, she takes them out to to have coffee or to have drinks, and that's the way she gets her info. Which is, and that's a good way. That's a good way. That's Even good. cops do. I interviewed Joseph Wamba for the LA Times Festival of Books on stage, and he said, "You want to know how I write my books? I take a bunch of cops to Ruth Chris and just keep feeding them steaks and drinks while I take notes." Mm -hmm. And he credits them all in his books. But now that he's so many years away from being a cop himself. That's what he does. He just plies other cops with steaks and liquor and gets all the stories. And they feel comfortable talking to him because A, he's a cop and he's proven himself as a terrific writer. Plus, right. A, open expense account. We don't get to Ruth Chris all that often <laughs> on what we're earning as, as cops. Yeah. You heard the secrets here, folks. I hope you're right. I hope you're all taking notes. This is the good stuff. Um, so the, the conflicts that they face, that, you, you know, leave, you were mentioning conflict, conflict, conflict. When you, when you were setting out to write this book, were those conflicts clear in your mind from yes. the beginning or did they arise as you wrote them? No, I knew them ahead going in. It's what makes the characters the characters. I think there's fake conflicts and you see them a lot. The easy ones, um, your, your wife has died or your husband has died or your family was murdered or you're an alcoholic or you're a drug addict uh, or you're a Vietnam veteran or whatever. There, there's some that just I call them cheap conflicts because they're so easy. Coming up with more nuanced conflicts, like, and again, I'm not doing this to toot my own horn, but Eve's conflicts are uniquely hers. There aren't other characters with the same conflicts. If you take Adrian Monk, yes, his, his wife died in, in, in Monk, but the fact that he had obsessive compulsive disorder already, and then his wife died and it, it turned his obsessive compulsive disorder, disorder into overdrive. And now he's driven by that sadness and by his terror of the world and his inability to cope, yet he's still striving to do so. His obsessive compulsive disorder was a conflict that was both tragic and funny and underpinned everything he ever did, every interaction, every observation, that was the prism through which we viewed him and he viewed the world and it made it utterly unique. And I think 
if you don't know what those conflicts are going in, if they aren't fresh conflicts, unique conflicts that are intertwined to other conflicts in the character, uh, they don't work. They feel irrelevant. They feel stitched on. I, I, I have a small publishing company and uh, we've been in business seven years. None of my books are published by the company. It's called Brash Books. And we get multiple submissions every day. And I, if I got a dollar for every submission where the cop was middle-aged and his family was murdered by a serial killer and his wife had left him and he's haunted by that, I could retire. I mean, it's just, or, or, or dying of a fatal disease. You want to come up with unique, shaded, subtle, con not necessarily subtle, but a, a tapestry of conflicts. Because let's face it, that's what we all are. All of us have conflicts. All of yeah. us have issues that, we're, that make us imperfect and that shape all of our personal and professional interactions. So I have yeah. the problem of being so damn good looking that no one knows how to, to interact with me. And it always creates this sort of tension in a room when I know they want me and have to hide it. You know, so that informs even now with the Zoom, I know there's that tension. So you know, this is how we deal with these things and, and it shapes our personalities and, and our conduct. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the conflict should kind of be, um, it, it's, it sort of fits into the story. And um, I, I do like to set them up in the beginning, and, but sometimes they come, become even more complex. You know, um, I, I like people, I, like, I also like characters who have a lot to hide, you know, like the, the hypocritical priest who, in, in, in my story, who, you know, condemns what he, you know, what he calls, um, you know, um, what's the word, you know, flirting with other people or lust in people's hearts and, and fornication and all this. And, you know, he's, he is actually an abuser himself. And um, those kind of, I like those kind of contrasts. They're not necessarily, well, they are conflicts in a way, but they're contrasts within a, a one person. So, you know, there can be character conflicts and there can also be conflicts within somebody and i i find those really really interesting you raise two very important points one you want the conflicts to be revealed through character and dialogue you don't want to open a book and say this is jim he's an alcoholic and right. here's a, you don't want to just do a giant info dump right. explaining every character and what their conflicts are and here's the other pet peeve i have in some crime fiction is the the writer will create a hero or a protagonist who has a lot of conflict, but then all the minor characters are just expositional tools to move the plot along. Every single character in your story has to have conflict. Every single character in your story has to have a goal, a purpose, other things they're doing in life. They don't exist just to answer questions for your hero. They don't exist just to help your hero with his plot. Bad guys aren't just bad. Bad guys think they're good people. Bad guys have families. Bad guys have desires and disappointments and regrets and, and goals and obstacles. They're doing other things besides waiting for your protagonist to come and ask them questions about their crime or what they know about a crime. So it's very important to give every character, even one who's only on your, in your book for a page, a life. What, I always ask myself, what was this shopkeeper doing before my hero walked in the door? What was his or her plan for the day? What's important to him or her? And how is this interaction getting in the way of that? So that everyone in a scene has a goal and in an end purpose. And that keeps the scene fresh because then you have two people who have different interests in a scene. If a character only exists to answer your protagonist's questions, that other character is a bore. Give that character something else. That character has been drinking coffee all day to stay awake and desperately has to go to the bathroom. And your character has just come in to ask him 50 questions about a crime that happened three years ago when all you want to do is go pee. You know, so that creates a tension. That's a simple one, but you see what I mean? It, it's come up with something for every single character so the, the scene lives. Do you write them out or you, you just sort of have them organically in your mind? If it's a minor character, kind of organically in my mind. If it's a character that's throughout the book, I have outlines. I'm a firm believer that you should know what you're writing before you start writing. 
or it shows on the page. So I have I have a bullet point out. Well, here's an example. I'm writing a novel now. This is not my outline. This is my book of notes. It's it's my out my outline's only about three or four pages. The rest are, are background, you know, research I've done on, on different things that I can refer to as I go. Um, so I do a lot of research ahead of time. It's born from my years in television, where while I'm writing the script, the rest of the production is prepping based on my outline. They're casting, building sets, finding locations, budgeting and all that. So my script has to follow the outline. The scripts I write for books are not nearly as detailed, but for a mystery, I know who done it and I know what the clues are. Um, for a thriller, I know the general scope of the story. That doesn't mean it's set in stone. I call them living outlines. I'm rewriting my outline as I go. I tend to finish my outline about two weeks before I finish my book. <laughs> so it's, it's a, but yes, you want to leave room for invention and, and creativity. You don't want to be stuck with something you came up with two months ago. Does your murderer ever change? Never. Never. Mine does. <laughs> I've had, I, I had like three different murderers on my last book. <laughs> Did you go back and change all the clues? Only the so third one sense? that worked. <laughs> but then you have to go back and do a lot of rewriting, don't you? To put make sure all the clues connect properly. And that I, I'm a firm believer that the reader should be able to go back and reread the book and see everything yeah. he or she missed. Yep. To see how it fits together. That nothing is done off screen. There's no forensic result or interview or, right. or something that happened that was not in front of the reader's eyes. Yeah. I believe that a mystery novel is a magic trick. Because right. what you're doing, you're saying, look over here, but not over here. So there's you tell the, the reader, I want you to look at the timeline. The, the, the murder is all about the timeline. But no, it's not about the timeline. It's about something else. So I'm always trying, you, no matter what I'm writing, diagnosis, murder, monk, my own novels, um, Mystery 101, any mystery I'm writing, it is a game of distraction. Yeah, it is a game of, yeah. Uh, the, art of, the art of misdirection, it's, it's, it's really, uh, it's, it, I think is really key. You know, have, have a lot, so, and, and I agree with you, you have to be really honest with your, your reader. Your reader sh should either know as much as um, your protagonist or, or maybe even more. And, and uh, no, no tricks, <laughs> no tricks. So you, you were talking about the conflicts in, in the character. So it, is it different when you're writing a series, when you're coming up with the conflicts for the character um, so that they can sustain and carry the weight of a series? Or Absolutely. Do you just... That's why it's important to have conflicts that are deep that or conflicts that will keep getting worse. Like uh, looking at Monk with his obsessive compulsive disorder, he's not going to be cured of that overnight. So it's going to flare up or flare down, whatever. I mean, and there'll be aspects of that obsessive compulsive disorder that will always reveal themselves. When uh, William Rabke and I, my, my television writing partner, and I took over Diagnosis Murder, you, uh, Quay was mentioning earlier that you know, no one will answer questions for, for someone uh, in Ghana because they're not cops and you know they, they just see it coming. I, I always thought it was stupid in Diagnosis Murder. This doctor shows up to ask about a murder and people answer his questions. Why don't they say, who are you? Uh, yeah. I'm a doctor of internal medicine at Community General Hospital. Why the hell should I answer a question? Yeah. Who are you to ask me about a murder? Go back and, and bandage somebody, you know, screw you. So I made that an issue. He wants to investigate crimes. No one wants to talk to him because he's a doctor. Right. And I made sure that every case had a medical component. So he had a reason to be there. Yeah. that there was a medical aspect to it but also his son in the series was a homicide detective and his dad the doctor is always showing him up well gee that should be an interesting conflict to explore how would you feel if your dad the doctor showed up at your place of work and, and made you look like a boob every week so <laughs> exploring those conflicts and making them part of the show i think gave the show many more years on the air than it would have had otherwise mm -hmm. uh the, the pleasure of colombo was always going to be how this guy who comes off as a working class schlub really isn't and goes right. up against these wealthy, uh, self-absorbed intellectuals yeah. and undoes yeah. their perfect murders. Yeah. And it's always the cat and mouse. And, and we love it because Columbo becomes more adept at it and tries new tricks. And, 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 and seeing that challenge every week is what made it so 
exciting because that show had an inherent conflict. This poor working class guy overmatched by murderers who were smarter, richer, and more powerful than him. How would he ever solve what we all know because we've seen the crime right. is a perfect murder. So yes, you must bake in really great conflicts if the if the series is not only going to succeed but be memorable i would argue that heart to heart and barnaby jones and canon on those shows were successful but they weren't memorable whereas remington steel which had a built-in conflict a woman trying to start her own private eye agency but no one will take her seriously so she creates a fictional private eye named remington steel and one day she catches this jewel thief in the midst of a crime and just as the cops come in, he says, I'm Remington Steele. And she's stuck with a guy who's a fraud, but she can't reveal it. And he's no detective, but he's pretending to be. And, and she's falling in love with him. So you have that conflict. And that made Remington Steele wonderful and made it last for so many years. The same thing about moonlighting. It's, it's finding a core conflict that can stay fresh because it's such a rich conflict. How do they know when it's time to end the series? Um, you can't. Oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I That's think the question that came in. Yeah. Well, you, you, I think it sort of, you have to, I read somewhere somebody said um, the time to take stock is after the fifth in the series. Uh, but you know there could be other factors. Remember, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle tried to uh, end Sherlock Holmes, and nobody would allow him. They were like up in arms that he killed Sherlock, so Sherlock had to come back. And Conan Doyle said, "You know what? I'm so sick of Sherlock Holmes." <laughs> but, <laughs> but you know, nobody wanted it to end. So, um, and also with in my case, Darko Dawson, there was a cliffhanger at the last one, and people are. P till this day, people are still asking, when is Darko coming back? Or you didn't kill him, did you? So sometimes the your reading public demands something that you know you might yourself be tired of. I don't know how you feel about it, Lee. I, I, I think when you've reached the point that it becomes work. I mean, it's always work. When it becomes a point that it doesn't engage you creatively that there are no more aspects like with monk i wrote four episodes of the tv series and i wrote 15 original monk novels two of which became episodes of the tv series and i found myself competing not just with my prior 14 novels but with 100 episodes of the television show and i just reached a point where i just didn't think there was anything more i could say about this character that would be fresh i can remember a moment where it hit me i was writing a scene and my, I was like so proud of myself. It's flowing so naturally. I'm so in touch with my muse. I'm so brilliant. It's just flowing so freely. And it's if it's writing itself. And I realized it was writing itself because I'd written it before. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I actually went back and found where I'd written it. And I went, okay, it's time to stop. And I hit the same point with Diagnosis Murder. I had written and produced 100 episodes of that show and then did eight novels. And I just, there was nothing more to say. There was, it would just be nothing more fresh. And I think it's hard for some creator. I think in, in Arthur Conan Doyle's case, he was just tired of, of the celebrity. And, and I don't think that the, the franchise had worn out yet. We, God knows there've been a thousand other Sherlock Holmes stories since then. But I think you have to reach a point creatively where you know it's time for you to stop. Yeah. Now in television, what's great about that is you can be a showrunner and say, it's time for me to stop. And they'll bring in someone else and they'll, inject the the series with new life because they have a whole new perspective on the characters and the stories you can't do that as an author mm -hmm. i think i won't mention some but there are some authors who should have stopped a long time ago and there are other authors like take ed mcbain the 87th precinct those books actually got better as time went on he changed as an author and, and his characters changed too and i would argue that the last few 87th precinct books are even better than the ones that started the series and how many were there 30 or something of those books? Yeah. If anybody has a question, you're welcome to actually say it. Unmute and say it. You could do that too. That might be easier than writing it up in the uh, chat. Anybody have anything? I have a question for you. Do you collect typewriters? I love all those typewriters behind do. you. Do. Or do you have a typewriter repair shop? No, no. <laughs> Not yet. Not yet. 
How many? Another do you have? question just came in. Okay, Michael, go ahead. Yes, uh, I, I I might mention first of all to uh, Lee that I live in Cornell, so uh, which is unincorporated Agora. Mm -hmm. So I'm right in the area that that you're writing about, and your books really kind of resonate on a different level with me. It's really fun to read about your own neighborhood. I get that a lot from people who live in Calabasas or in the area or know the area that I actually got it right. What's more frustrating is when I get, you know, emails from people in Macau saying you didn't describe this street just right or whatever. It's like, <laughs> who's going to know except you? And even if you're off a little bit, things change so quickly. Yeah. That, yeah. Uh, as long as it doesn't detract from the story, it makes sense to me. It's fiction, yeah. uh, as you mentioned. But I, I'm curious for both of you whether it's easier to write a series or a standalone novel, and which one you prefer? Um, I like I like series because that's mostly what I've done. But I I would like to throw in a, a standalone at some point. Um, it might be a little harder because it has to be so different from your your series, and you might be competing with your series. So, in that regard, it might be harder. But I I would prefer to write a series than to write a, a number of standalone novels. I think, to me, I think it would be difficult. I would. I find totally it. agree. And there's a real pleasure in getting back in a world with characters you know. It also makes the writing easier to some degree because you know the characters so well, yeah. you know how they would react in a situation. Yeah. And you aren't inventing the, the wheel from scratch. Like right now I'm writing a standalone thriller and it's so much harder. I'm like waiting for my publisher to tell me to go ahead and write the fourth you've run it so I can set this book aside. You know, I just, I want to go back to the comfort and ease of, it's not to say it's easy to write a, a series. In fact, you can get too comfortable. And that's another reason why I've left TV series is it's like, all right, I've been doing the same thing over and over. I want to challenge myself. And I've written, when I wrote Lost Hills, I didn't know it'd be a series. You know, it depended on the success of, of, of Lost Hills. I wrote another book called True Fiction that was meant to be a standalone and it did so well that my publisher demanded a sequel. It's like, I don't know if I have one in me. And it turned out I did. But that, you know, it, it's tough. It's tough. I think there's a real comfort in writing a series and I prefer that, but it can become a trap. Yeah. I'd like to, I'd like to have the career that um, Michael Connolly has. He writes his Boshes, but he also has the Lincoln Lawyer, and he has the uh, the, the new uh, female cop character, and he has the occasional standalone. I don't know that I could do what um, Lee Child has done or or Jan Ivanovich, where you're writing essentially one series forever. I mean, Janet spun off with Fox and O'Hare with me, but really her, her meat and potatoes is is Stephanie Plum and. Lee Child has never done anything but Jack Reacher. Yeah. I, I would have to be able to break things up with other books. So I have a question. So do you write, do either of you write anything other than mystery thriller? <laughs> well, I mean, Lee seems to have written everything, so. <laughs> well, in books, only mysteries and thrillers. In television, I've written Baywatch and She-Wolf of London and Sequest. I've written about everything. I've even written Talking Dolphins. I mean, it's, <laughs> I, I've done everything in television, but except for situation comedy. Yeah. Um, I tried my hand at uh, romance novels. That was a disaster, <laughs> um, a, a complete disaster. Uh, and then it, when I started writing uh, early on, I had, um, you know, sort of the great, the grand sweeping, epic novel, you know, I wrote a book of 750 pages. I don't think I could even write that now. But um, so that was a kind of like one of those novels that spans the globe and spans centuries and all that kind of stuff. Uh, uh, but nah, my, my heart really is, is in mystery. It's, it has been since I was a kid. Have you thought about going back and rewriting that 750 page book and turning it into a 450 page one? Uh, actually, I did that. I actually, uh -huh. I actually trimmed it down, and it was a whole lot better because there was a lot of crap in there. <laughs> so, will you be seeing that soon? Um, no, I, you know, I, I moved on to other stuff, and um, I, I could look at it again, possibly, but uh, it's not, not in me right now. <laughs> Arabella has a question. Arabella. Hi, Arabella. 
unmute and ask your question. So my question has to do with the publishing side when you're working um, on a contract. Since you like to write series, are you getting a contract for multiple books? And how does that work? Because I know I've talked to two other authors. One said she basically does five or six book deal and another one who does romance writings and she usually does a three book deal. How does that work? I think it's well, different for every author. It depends on how good your agent is and what kind of deal you want to accept. When I, um, when I sold Lost Hills, I believe it was a two book deal. Maybe it was a three book deal, but it wasn't specified. The next two books would be Eve Ronan novels. Um, but my last, like, like right now, I don't know if I'll be doing a fourth Eve Ronan. I don't have a contract for anything. So I'm writing a, you know, a book on spec. We'll see what happens, but they could very well, I, my second Eve Ronan book just came out in, in January. The third one is coming out this fall. So there's not a real pressure on them at this moment to green light a fourth one, but I'm, I'm expecting I'll probably be asked to do one, but I wouldn't write a fourth Eve Ronan novel without a contract. It would okay. be insane. Um, I will write a standalone book without a contract, but I will not write the second or third or fourth novel in a series without a contract because it's it's a waste of time and, and doomed to failure. There's also another issue in multi-book contracts. Um, it's probably getting too much into the weeds for you, but I'll bring it up anyway. There's something called joint accounting. And sometimes what they'll do with multi-book deals is say, we'll pay you this advance, but we'll, we want to see how all the books in your deal earn out before we We'll pay you any royalties, and and I'm I'm very much against that. So I, I take I, if they're going to throw in joint accounting, then I'll only take single book contracts because I want each book to succeed or fail on its own merits, and not have my royalties tied to how my previous book uh, did. So it, it's very different. I, I think if you're offered a million dollar contract, then maybe <laughs> you can take joint accounting, and that's not so bad because the the publisher's taking a big risk on you. But I'm not in that league yet. I like the um, the comfort that comes from a contract, but uh, in, in general, um, I probably write most of my stuff on spec and sell it, and then get a contract for one or two books after that. Yeah, I've only had a, a two big um, two book deal with my UK publishers. Uh, they wanted both um, the first, uh, the Missing American, and then uh, Sleep Well, My Lady. And, uh, but all the others, uh, they've always been single uh, contracts. It's usually around the time I submit um, the synopsis of one, the contract is usually written up, you know, a few weeks after that. Okay. Anybody else? I have one more question and that is, do your tertiary characters ever get their own books, get their own sort of plots or stories? Uh, mine don't, but Lee might have. <laughs> they're they're called tertiary characters for a reason. <laughs> they're tertiary. Um, when I did the monk novels, uh, Natalie, his assistant, got her own story. Um, because, and but in fact, she narrated the book. She they're basically her stories anyway. It was her observations of monk, but there were stories where she was at at the center. But when you talk about spinoffs. And I don't know what the situation with with Quay is with it with Soho, but um, you want to be careful because if you're spinning off a character that another publisher has published, you can get into a big rights nightmare, mm -hmm. and you don't want that that mm -hmm. happening. So there's a business aspect to the creative decisions you make. It's probably not a wise move to write a spinoff character from an existing series because that limits how places you can take that character, and publishers who are going to be willing to publish that character's book. Yeah. Um, that's, there's a big difference. I think also when you're writing for a living and when you're writing for fun, you have to make a lot of decisions based on what's best for the business, what's <laughs> best for the brand, what's best for the, the series franchise yeah. that you don't, if you have a day job doing something else. Yeah, definitely. I agree. Christina. I just wanted to thank you both. This was really enjoyable and a lot of information. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Any other questions? Barb, do you see Diane? Yeah, yeah. I just have one question. I thought uh, she was waving at us. <laughs> 
So is it a nine to five job? I mean, are you just writing all the time or are you know, you disciplined to say, I'm gonna write, you know, these many hours a day. I'm new, so. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I always admire authors who have this, um, you know, goal of a number of words every single day. I mean, my hat's off to them because, I mean, there's some days, you know, life happens and I just don't get to it. I may, you know, write one page and, but, you know, over several days, You're breaking maybe up, I'll write way. 10. And, and it's usually as I get closer and closer to, to my deadline date, that's when I start writing faster and faster and faster. Um, and it's not really nine to five. Uh, you know, when I, when I retired from medicine, I thought, you know, oh man, I'm gonna have all this time to write. But, you know, it got filled with all sorts of other stuff, you know, the, the promotion, the marketing and all that. So, you know, it doesn't work out that, you know, you have all this, you have like stacks and stacks of time to suddenly, suddenly write. Um, you know, I'm, I'm probably writing at about the same pace that I did when I was a, a physician, practicing physician. Mm -hmm. I, um, I don't write banker's hours, but I, I, I have a, a bifurcated career. I'm not a doctor but I also write for television and I have a publishing company. So, and I, and I have books I've written that are still coming out. So I have edits and stuff to do on them or I have a book that's coming out and I have promotion to do for that yeah. or I have a TV script. So my day is sort of broken down like this. I, I wake up, you're gonna think this is strange, but I'll get to why. I wake up around 10 in the morning. I have breakfast and then I tend to do whatever is most pressing. Like if, if I have a an immediate deadline on a script, that's usually what I will jump onto. But the day is spent mostly rewriting what I've written the night before and dealing with the business of being a writer, dealing with drafts of books that have come into my publishing company or re notes on a script that I've done or meetings with my agent about a contract. I mean, the day goes by really fast dealing with the business of writing. Then I also have a personal life with my wife and you know, walk the dog and what have you. Then I have dinner around 6.30, 7 o'clock, and then I write till about 2 in the morning. That's when I do all of my quality writing between 8 p.m. and 2 in the morning or 1 or 2 in the morning. And it could be a script. It could be a book. It's whatever is the, the most pressing deadline is what I'm working on first. And then I repeat the process next morning. I rewrite what I did the day before. I do all my business, and I get to the original writing in the evening. Now, that can change if a deadline's coming up, yeah. you know, then, then my whole day could be just on the book or just on the script. Um, but I have never missed a deadline in my life. Even when I had two broken arms, I did not miss my deadline. Um, I, that's one thing I love about a contract is a contract forces you to deliver yeah. a book on a certain date. Yeah. This book I'm working on now, I should have finished a long time ago, but I don't have a deadline. So mm -hmm. I don't feel that same pressure. I let other things get in the way. A deadline focuses me and, and I don't have a word count. I just know, because I've been doing this for a long time, my book or script will be done on time. And I just let my, I have days where I'm lucky if I get a good paragraph out. I mean, I might write five pages the next morning, cut them all except for a paragraph. But then I might have other days where I write 15 pages and, they're, and they work. I just have to be confident in my own bio rhythms and Chemi yeah. chemistry, whatever, that the book will happen and not beat myself up too much when I don't have a good day. Yeah, yeah I agree totally. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions from anybody? Well, let, me, let me just back up to one thing. Sure. The most important thing is put your butt in the chair and write. You cannot rewrite a blank page. So even if your writing is horrible, if it's just a pile of steaming crap, at least you have something you can fix and, and you can see what went wrong. You have something to work on. So I force myself to write even when I know that everything coming out is garbage. <laughs> I don't allow a day to go by where it's just a blank page. I will write something. Yeah. Great. Thank you. <laughs> well, if there's nothing else that we need to do, the talk books are about. available. Oh, Mystery. yes, from Mystery Inc. <laughs> from this lovely books. young lady. She has mine signed. Do you want to give any details, Deb? Well, you can go to the bookstore. You can go to mysteryinc.com 
Or if you want to just get it shipped, um, you can just go to bookshop.org link. So, okay. uh, but like Lee said, here's a signed at the store and I've got Quay's books there and, or they can be shipped, whichever works out for you. And she's got like all my books signed. She, she even has grocery lists and, and old Christmas cards of mine signed. Anything that I have signed, I just send to her store and she finds a way to monetize it. <laughs> okay. We like it. Well, thank you everybody for being here and thank you Lee and Quay and, and uh, it's, you've given, a, given us great information. You've been very generous. Thank with, you. With thank your you. process and your nice book. To have you. Thank you. I'm sorry we couldn't do this all in person. And especially yeah. not that we couldn't all do it at, at Debbie's store because she always has terrific cake. <laughs> <laughs> the day will come, the day will come. Someday. Yeah. Thank you. All right, Thank bye you. folks. Bye. bye.